Time for more unbridled geekery on relational frame theory. And I'm going to try to keep my voice at a volume that doesn't peak out, make you miserable with the distortion. So, in the first video, we talked about stimulus equivalence, and we talked about what is, is the basic relational frame of correspondence when we say X is Y, and how humans uh, get a free derived stimulus relation that if X refers to Y, we derive Y refers to X. And uh, in the second video, I emphasized the importance of and clarifying of what a stimulus function is and what behavior analysts mean when they say uh, such and such has a stimulus function or has acquired stimulus functions. Well, what is a stimulus function? Uh, it's basically what the stimulus does to us makes us feel sick, or makes us want to run away, or makes us sneeze, or makes us uh, shout Zimbabwe, or whatever it is. That's the stimulus function. Uh, and today, what I'd like to do is um, nail down the concept of transfer of stimulus function, and then take that a little further uh, to the more general case of transformation of stimulus function when we're talking about relational frames other than correspondence. So we'll introduce a few of the relational frames. So, first of all, this idea of a transfer of stimulus function, trans or more visual transfer of stimulus function. Last time I used some foreign language examples and I uh, used this Hebrew word mechabel. Mechabel, uh, we talked about the non-arbitrary properties, non-arbitrary stimulus functions, uh, meaning the ones that come from the physical properties of the sound of the word, just kind of sounds guttural or Hebraic or Semitic. And then the arbitrary stimulus functions that come into play, if you don't know Hebrew, they come into play when I say that mechabel is the same as terrorist. So that it is, mechabel is terrorist. Now terrorist has certain arbitrary stimulus functions. We arbitrarily have a certain meaning for that sound in English. And in Hebrew we arbitrarily have some meaning for the word mechabel. It happens to be the same thing. When I let you know that mechabel means terrorist, at that point the functions of the word terrorist transfer to the sound mechabel for you. So that now that does, doesn't just sound guttural, it might evoke fear or might evoke certain imagery or thoughts and so forth that before it didn't. Now this is where relational frame theory starts to get a little more exciting because for instance if I have a recurring thought such as Joe Reinwine, I am an idiot. I am the same as idiot. What language guarantees, relational frame theory shows us, is that the stimulus functions of the word idiot are going to stick onto me. They're going to transfer to me in my mind uh, so that uh, stimulus functions such as wanting to move away from something. Oh, that guy's an idiot. Leave him alone. Don't go near him. Or uh, wanting to look down upon something and say, oh, <laughs> look at that stupid idiot. Uh, or having contempt for something are all evoked by the word idiot. And now that I've had the thought, I am an idiot, then I now have these uh, stimulus functions. I look down on myself. I have contempt for myself. I want to move away from myself, and so forth. So that's a transfer of stimulus function, or two examples, one with the Hebrew word and one with uh, me thinking that I am an idiot, having that thought. Now, um, what about transformation of stimulus function? Uh, an expression you'll hear RFT people and ACT people throw around quite a bit. Well, uh, to go there, we should introduce some other relational frames, because that's just the more general case that applies in all relational frames, uh, not just that of correspondence. So, there are other relational frames. For example, 
I will shuffle, shuffle around some papers until I pull one up that has a few little very skillfully executed drawings, such as this. Uh, so in this case, we have a larger square and a smaller square. And so we might make statements like, this is bigger than this. This square is bigger than this square. So now we have a relational frame of bigger than, which in the other direction is not the same. It's smaller than. So that this is bigger than this entails that this is smaller than this. Okay. So rather than um, stimulus equivalence, what we have is mutual entailment that x being bigger than y entails that y is smaller than x. And then that is the derived stimulus relation that uh, is spontaneously derived by human beings. Uh, and it is just part of what we mean when we say that something's bigger than something else. We, we mean also that that something else is smaller than the first thing. Uh, similarly, uh, if we say something a little, this, this by the way, this is, this is non-arbitrary. You can see with your eyes that this is bigger than this, and vice, or not vice versa, but the mutually entailed relation that this is smaller than this. But then we could get into some uh, arbitrary things. Like we could say um, money is better than love. Might be a little uh, cynical of us to say that, but we could say money is better than love, which would entail that love is not as good as money, or love is worse than money. Okay. Now we can see too that if we say uh, I am worse, or let's say let's say I think in my mind you are better than me. He's better than me. She's better than me. You're better than me. What that entails is that I am worse than you. Right? Okay? So, uh, you, I may think, are good, and I am worse than you. What does that make me? That makes me bad. That's something of a transformation of stimulus function. Um, a perhaps somewhat clearer example may be found, again, for those visual folks, we have my beautiful handwriting, transformation of stimulus function. So we might have a small child, and we might um, have a child that doesn't understand money yet and doesn't read numbers, uh, and the arbitrary excuse me, the non-arbitrary properties of two coins might be that this one is smaller than this one, and the child may think that the larger one is more desirable. And at that point, the stimulus function of the larger coin is to make the child want to take that coin if you give her a choice of which coin she may have. She may choose which one. Perhaps she may be attracted to the one that's larger and choose it. So its stimulus function is that of uh, appetizing her, getting, getting her to want to choose it, to take it. If you then tell her, oh, uh, actually, um, Saida, um, that coin is actually worth twice as much as this one. This one's much more worth, has much more worth than this one does. Boom! The stimulus function changes. Stimulus function of this coin is now transformed such that it is the one that has greater attractiveness and that Saida may reach out and uh, grab that coin. So that would be a transformation of stimulus function through the relational frame of value. X is more valuable than Y. Y is less valuable than X. Um, a clinical application might be, for instance, if I said something like, oh, that anxiety sounds like it's really painful to you. But what if I told you that for every hour you, were, you spent anxious, 
because you were going out and asking out attractive members of the same sex if you uh, have that inclination or members of the opposite sex if you have a, a different inclination? What if I told you that every hour you spent anxious doing that improved your chances of finding a suitable mate? The stimulus function of the anxiety may change, whereas before the anxiety had only repellent functions. Get, get me away from that anxiety. Now maybe just a little bit, maybe the anxiety has a little bit more of an appetitive function. Merely by my having, in my position of authority, stated or suggested, what if your time spent anxious could result in your finding a mate. Well, my phone's ringing, so it must be time to finish the video. Talk to you soon.